right? You do have a dumbing down effect. This is the reason why, because the old brains align very quickly. Okay? <clears throat> Money's very important to us. Uh, Grug here, he's all about surviving. So Grug is after food, shelter. We're after money. That's survival for us today. That is food, that is shelter. Okay? That is, that is, is warmth, that is comfort. What we're trying to do is meet our needs, same as Greg, and we're trying to get up to that survival level there. We want to survive. That's our, you know what I mean? If we get into here, well, that's good. We like it in abundance, but basically that's the objective. Does everyone understand that? So we're, we're trying to fulfil our needs, get to there exactly the same as Greg. And for us today, that's money. That's money. That's why it plays such an important role. All right? People say, money is not important to me. Rubbish. It's as important to you as it is to me because it represents survival. All right? So, very important point. <clears throat> Once the amygdala is happy that we're going to survive, it'll shift its focus to making us feel good. Here's an interesting uh, observation. It doesn't like the amygdala, it doesn't like to go beyond this level. So it likes to meet our needs and get to survival, but it doesn't want to go beyond. What are you doing if you push into abundance, if you try to do more than just survive? You're taking unnecessary risk, aren't you? What unnecessary, you're taking unnecessary risk. We don't need to do this. What are you doing this for? Ever feel that? Okay. It's often referred to as the resistance. I have this oh, resistance inside me. That's what they call the comfort zone. Yeah, yeah. Why go outside your comfort zone? If you're, if you're you know, paying the bills, paying the mortgage, food on the table, why go any further? Okay? So we really, that's our objective there, the lizard brain. All right? That's its objective, is just to survive. What happens when people do become enabled... All right? And they're no longer working off their needs. They don't have their needs to guide them. Why do I get out of bed in the morning? Because I've got to pay the mortgage. I've got to drive the kids to school. All right? So my needs give me, give me a life plan. Okay? You suddenly win Tats Lotto and you're enabled. Forget about survival. You don't have to worry about survival anymore. Okay? You're operating up here. What are you going to do? If you're like everybody else, you'll become selfish. That's the natural state. What do the majority of people who win Tats Lotto do? Blow themselves up. Why? Because they become selfish. Suddenly their marriages fail and all this sort of thing and they earn all this strife and so many of them say, I was better off before I won Tats Lotto. I was seriously better off. You know, it's destroyed my life. That's, that's usually why. Because they move off operating on this needs paradigm to operating on a self paradigm. They become enabled and their natural instinct is to be selfish. Fascinating stuff. Plus, fascinating stuff. And <clears throat> we'll talk more about the implications of being selfish very shortly. Sure, sure. No, no, in, in the statistics they've taken, I think the majority of people actually have said they were worse off than when before they won Tats Lotto. Because quite often they lost the money or their marriage failed. Or You see it with other enabled people. You see it with... Uh, heard of uh, Lindsay Lohan? She's having a little bit of a hard time. You know, she's enabled, she's got fame, she's got fortune. Bit of a hard time handling it, yes? OK, so we see a lot of people... Not only enabled through Tats Lotto, that's a fairly obvious case. We see a lot of people enabled uh, in other fields, you know, actors. What about young football players? Mm, yeah. You know, I'm a very successful football player. I've got a lot of money. I'm very famous. I think I'll go and get a picture of my testicles on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> that's a huge move, isn't it? Yeah. So, <laughs> what they do is during the year, during the year, 
What's their objective? During the footy season, I'm going to win. I've got structure. I've got a coach. I've got a fitness coach. I've got a skills coach. I've got a this, I've got a that, I've got a physio, I've got a masseuse, I've got, uh, you know, I've got all this structure around me, I've got a clear objective, a clear objective, no problems there. What's working? You know, the neocortex, all this structure, all this plan, what they're actually working on, I can't write it up here, it'd be goals. We've got goals and we're working towards those goals, all right, during the year. So all these footy players have these clear goals, they have this really strong structure around them, they really get into trouble during the season. Come the end of the season and it's whoopee time. Why? They've got no objective, they've got no structure, okay? They've got, you know, no, no, no sort of organisation, no, no, no objective like winning. What do they do? Self. That becomes, that becomes their, uh, their paradigm. Self. And they get themselves into all sorts of trouble. All right? Uh, and that's what happens. So often we see people uh, get past survival for whatever reason. It might be that they suddenly become a movie star, they're a successful football player, uh, or they win Tats Lotto. Suddenly they're enabled and they drop straight into this self-paradigm. Okay? The ones who don't, these guys, are very selfless. They share they spend their time and their money helping others. Okay? Um, I keep forgetting his name. Paul Newman. Paul Newman raised over a quarter of a billion dollars for charity through his uh, spaghetti sauce, uh, spaghetti sauce uh, sales. We buy it all the time. I won't let my wife bring any other sauce into the house. All right? It's amazing what he's done. Over a quarter of a billion dollars for charity. All right? Warren Buffett's given away most of his fortune. He's uh, actually Bill Gates' mentor. Bill Gates and his wife now spend most of their time running around working out how they're going to give their money away. So these people work very hard at sharing their resources. Okay? It's a learnt behaviour and they've got very, well, for all appearances, very happy, healthy lives. There is a lot to really be said for sharing and helping others. Okay? Really important. Because if you don't, you're likely to slip into this self-paradigm. And that's very dangerous. All right? So these guys seem to have it figured out. And if you look at the examples of the people who are sort of travelling well and doing well, you find, gee, they're all sort of giving it away, you know? But there's a saying, you've got to give it away to keep it. You've got to give it away to keep it. Very true. And that's why, because our natural instinct, if we're enabled, is to slip into the self paradigm. Very important. Okay, stress gauge. The old brain, um, one of its primary functions is to detect and react to danger. So it's our sort of, it connects to, this is the amygdala here. You can see it pictured at the core of our brain. And it's sort of, it's sort of our internal stress gauge. Okay? And what it does, it detects stress. It detects problems and it reacts and it wants to relieve stress. It's always trying to relieve the stress. What can it do? It runs away. Okay? Ever tried to pat a lizard? It'll probably scamper off. Okay? So initial react or oh, bugger off. Okay? Uh, fights for control. All right? I don't play very well with other children. I didn't do it when I was young. I don't do it now at age 50. Uh, I tend to play alone, uh, hence I work by myself, okay? Because if I can't be in control, I don't want to play. So I tend to be in fights for control. <laughs> so gathers, hoards resources. That's going to relieve my stress. If you notice, if I put a million dollars in your bank account, Quentin, are you going to feel safer and more secure? You relax a little bit? Just, yeah. So... <laughs> so... So there you go. <laughs> Give it a whirl. Okay. So, <laughs> so gathers, hoards resources. Very important. That will relieve our stress. The more money I've got, the more resources I've got. Okay. What do people do to make themselves feel good? Go shopping. All right. Okay. Get stuff. You know. I have more stuff. I'll feel good about myself. 
Uh, have a backup plan. This is a really good one. It's a really good one. Have a backup plan. Always have a backup plan. All right? No matter what you're doing, if you're feeling a bit stressed about it, have a fallback plan. All right? Uh, it really does help to relieve stress. More about that shortly. But very, very important point. Okay? Uh, sometimes the lizard brain will hijack the neocortex and self-justify, like when you punch someone and you say, hang on, I, he deserved it, you know? Because when you punch someone, of course, you think, I'm in trouble, <gasps> and you get stressed, and then, of course, you self-justify. More about that shortly. Okay? So, <clears throat> hijacking the neo... Do what you did before. Repeat what you did previously. If you do something and it feels good, and it doesn't hurt, do it again. That's where the habitual part comes in. All right? Repeat that behaviour. Okay? Repeat that behaviour. Do what you did before. Distracting yourself. Ever go and watch a movie? Ever be stressed or something, and you go and watch a movie, and you just get out of your head for a while, you know? With me, it's snow skiing. You know, when I'm barreling down a hill popping my knee as I was this season, you know, um, I'm kind of forgetting about everything else. So I distract myself. Uh, sex, food, they work too, okay? Do nothing. Nothing can go wrong. Couldn't be safer. It's secure. I know a lot of people who do that. Don't try, can't fail. That's the way I like to put it. Don't try, can't fail. All right? Too true. So that's a natural state for the amygdala. It wants to relieve stress, just avoid doing anything. Don't take any chances. Use mind-altering substances. This is an old favourite of mine. I am a sober alcoholic. All right, and I'll talk more about that shortly. That used to be my number one method of relieving stress. Ever get home at night after a really busy, hard day and you, you, you get that two fingers of whiskey and you go whack and you go, oh, Yes. <laughs> That's right. Oh, lovely. And of course, what's happened is you've just, you've now, your amygdala is swimming in whiskey. <laughs> so it doesn't get stressed. And what you're doing is you're relieving stress. That's why you take mind altering substances, alcohol or other mind altering substances, or you use stimulants smoke, sugar, exercise. I don't smoke anymore. I've done, I've done the whole lot. I've, done the, I've, done the, I've got the, you know, um, all three, the trifecta. Um, but I've given up the fags. I'm still into the sugar and the exercise. And I do love both. So I exercise and it distracts me. And uh, certainly when I eat sugar, it distracts me. You know, I love sugar. Okay. There's another very special way that we can relieve stress. And it's unique to human beings. Using hope. If you go back to the lizards for a second, the lizards, <coughs> with just an amygdala, can't be trained. You can't train a lizard. Try to, try to get a lizard to do tricks, roll over, chase a stick, something like that. It, it won't end well. You can't train an amygdala. It's working on just preset programming. So it's got this lizard brain, and it's just got those survival sort of mandates, fee, flight, freeze, food, fornicate, that sort of stuff. That's it. Okay, So you can't train the thing. On the other hand, animals with a limbic system can be trained because their memory and emotion centre can, can associate different behaviours with positive and negative feedback. So what do you do if you say to your dog, sit, 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 it sits, and then you reward it? Ah, if I sit, I get a reward. Do you get the idea? Then again, if it poos inside, we belt it over the head. All right? And it goes, hmm, bad idea. Next time, go outside. So, <laughs> so if, you, if an animal has a limbic system, it can be trained. Now, this is an important distinction. It can be trained. It can't be taught. It hasn't got a neocortex. It hasn't got a thinking brain. But it has a brain that can associate behaviours with positive and negative responses, okay? So we can be trained. We have a limbic system. We can be trained, all right? Very rarely will training override instincts. I cannot do anything to stop my cats from killing birds and bringing them inside the house. 
I cannot train them not to do it. Okay? All I can do is lock them out. It's an instinctive behaviour and they're going to do it no matter what I do. Okay, higher order primates with neocortexes can be taught. We humans are at the top of this list. It includes also chimpanzees and gorillas. Very important, we are teachable, we can be taught. We can learn. So we can be trained and we can be taught. You need to understand this distinction, it's very important. Lizards, you can't train or teach a lizard. You can train a cat or a dog. You can teach a higher order primate because they have a neocortex. Very important. <clears throat> we humans have one extra feature. We have this ability to project with our neocortex. Project, anticipate, imagine. Think of it as a what-if capability. And because we have this what-if capability, we can create positive expectations. That is hope. So you hear about people staying alive in the most incredibly hopeless situations where the probability of success is almost nil, and yet they will persevere and persevere and persevere against all logical odds. Why? Because they've got some little positive, tiny, tiny positive expectation of this could happen and this could happen and this might just happen and I'm going to live through this. And you hear about amazing human feats of survival, don't you, all the time, and achievement because they can hang on, they can create these positive expectations which will help them hang on. That is a unique feature to human beings. Hope is the ultimate plan B. You can't see it there, there's sharks there. All right. Plan B uh, provides stress relief. So the neocortex can actually come up, well, we could, this possibly could happen, and then the lizard brain says, oh, I think I'll hang on to that. So that actually can provide, hope provides stress relief for our lizard brain when a situation looks, as I say, you know, probability of success nil. There's positive and negative applications of hope. Patients that have a very, very, very slim chance of survival will hang on, hang on, hang on if they have some hope, some slim, slim hope. All right? And you hear your stories about this. They, they try everything. They try all these radical approaches, you know, and, and they try all that because it gives them hope. It gives them hope. We'll do all these crazy things, you know, do all the conventional things, and you start doing all the crazy things, you just don't want to give up. Because your lizard brain's saying, give me some hope. Give me some hope. I need some hope. What happens when the situation becomes hopeless? They die. Right? They die. Because they give up. Right? They give up. So hope's a very powerful thing there, very positive, very negative here. Gambling. Why do people gamble? You don't do it for any rational reason because I can tell you if you put your money in the machine downstairs, you'll get 91 cents in the dollar back. It's a losing, it's, it's rationally speaking, it's a completely a losing enterprise. Now all our neocortexes know that. We all know that that's why you know, these places have those machines. We know they're going to win. Why do people do it? Why do, you, why do they do it? I've sponsored gamblers, right, as, as, a, as a person dealing in, uh, uh, you know, with, with other people with addictions, I've actually sponsored gamblers. They sit there at that machine and the, the longer the odds, the better. Because, you know, I'm a, I'm a mathematical person, so I think, well, oh, take, the, take the safest bet, you know what I mean? Take the 50-50 bet, or the thing closest to the 50-50 bet. That seems like well, I'm more likely to have a win there. They, don't, they want the longest odds. They want the million-dollar jackpot they're never going to win. Why? Because when they press that button on that poker machine... They press that button and those wheels start to spin. I could be rich. I could be rich. This could be it. All my problems are solved. Until it goes clunk, 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 and they get a result. But in that period in between, when they press that button and they get the result, during that period, they've got hope. Hope. How big's their hope? Their hope is as big as that jackpot up there. Get the idea? So it's all about hope. If you ever buy a Tats Lotto ticket, you've got very poor chances of winning Tats Lotto. 
make it count, buy it right at the start of the week. So you get as much hope out of it as you can. Because <laughs> that's all it's worth. Right? So that's a sort of negative application of hope. But it does give people hope. I buy a Tats Lotto ticket, maybe I can change my situation. All right? But our amygdalas are trying to relieve stress. And they will do anything to relieve stress. So the addictive, the, the addicted gambler, the compulsive gambler, what's their amygdala saying to them? Go back and do it again. Go back and do it again. Go back and do it again. Even when they have a win and they win, they win 20 grand, what do they do? Go back and do it again. Because they get stuck. They get hooked on that euphoric feeling of hope when they put that gamble on, they put that bet on. Get the idea? Very important. Okay, so negative application of hope. We master our old brain, we train it. Okay? We teach the neocortex. We train the limbic system. So we train animals. Very important, the use of these words. We train animals and small children through pleasure and pain association. All right? Yeah, this is, that's a really, so, so, such a silly argument. It really is. I'll talk about that shortly. I've got an example up here. So, but we train. You can't teach in many ways. You can't teach small children. They haven't got it developed enough neocortex. And you don't, you, don't, you don't teach their lizard brain. You train it. Kid throws a temper tantrum. Kid throws a temper tantrum. You train small children not to throw tantrums. You throw a temper tantrum. That's a fight response, by the way, in your lizard brain. Have you noticed that a lot of kids throw temper tantrums and they all look exactly the same? They hit the ground, you know, thrash it on the ground. It all looks identical. Yes? It's, it's an internal fight response. I'm not getting what I want. Okay? Because it's the lizard brain that's doing it, you have to train the child. You can't reason with a three-year-old or a four-year-old that's having a temper tantrum. You've got to give them some sort of negative association so they don't have a tantrum. Or if I have a tantrum, now, some of the older kids, you can punish them. You can say, look, if you do that, I'm going to do this to you for the next week. But generally you can't do that because the lizard brain doesn't have any, doesn't, like it's instant gratification. It's, it's associating with what's going on now. It's like when you're training a dog. If you don't catch, or let's say, or let's say a cat, if you've got a cat that poops inside, yes, who's had that happen to them? A cat that's pooped inside? Yes, of course. Okay. If you don't find the cat reasonably soon after it's pooped, or you've got two cats like I do, and you're not too sure which one, you can't punish them. It's too late because they need that immediate association. I'm not, I'm not trying to vent my anger with my cats by hitting them. You know what I mean? I'll take them up and say, no, no, smack them on the head. But I've got to do it fairly soon after they've done the poop, or they won't get the point. And it's the same thing with kids who throw tantrums. If you're going to train them, you've got to do it pretty quickly. They need that immediate negative association. All right? Because they're, they're working within their feeling, emotional centre. All right? So the idea that you can teach them not to have tantrums doesn't really work. They really need to be trained not to have a tantrum. Anyone ever seen a fully grown adult throw a temper tantrum? Because they weren't taught not to do it as children? <laughs> Okay, I won't go there. Uh, but you have to be... I've seen... I had a, a mate who was about 24 years old who th threw a temper tantrum, throws te temper tantrums. Because when he was a child, when he threw a temper tantrum, he got pacified. Calm down, calm down. What can we do for you? What can we do for you? Calm down. So he got pacified and he usually got placated with some sort of reward. 24 years old, fully grown man, about this tall. All right? Working on the tools... And one day he decided to do his block and throw a shifter about that long. And we didn't know where it was going. And we all ducked for cover, you know. Violent, dangerous man because he throws temper tantrums. He, he hasn't been taught at a young age. And now, of course, it's a learnt behaviour. Very dangerous. So uh, you get, <laughs> as I say, get into adulthood and they're still throwing tantrums. We can trick the old brain. Remember I said to you it likes to do one thing at a time? Okay. Women... Broken relationship. The boyfriend's left you. Okay, well, you go over to the girlfriend's house, you get out the ice cream, and you sit there and you commiserate and you, and you eat ice cream. You, you see it on the movies all the time. Does it work? Yes, it does work. Because your lizard brain, the limbic systems, the thing that's all emotional upset, 
and it goes, oh, ice cream. <laughs> and it gets completely distracted. It can't be upset about the emotional crisis it's in and be eating ice cream at the same time. So it's eating ice cream, it's forgetting about that. So it does give you temporary relief. It distracts the lizard brain. Are you relating to this? Are you relating to this stuff? It's very important you relate to this stuff. Okay, a lot of context here. A lot of context. So you see that, next time you see it on TV or in the movies, you go, oh, I know why that works. All right, because you can distract your lizard brain with food. Loves yummy, sugary stuff. Okay, a <laughs> more subtle example. All right? <laughs> more subtle example. We read a book, we go to bed. I go to bed, I'm thinking about the family, I'm thinking about work, and I'm thinking about what I'm going to do tomorrow, and I'm thinking about this and that, and I can't go to sleep. Okay? Now, my lizard brain is awake 24-7. Your lizard brain, your old brain, never goes to sleep. It's controlling your automatic body functions. Right? And if it's stressed, it will grab your attention. You can't, have you ever tried, have you ever been stressed about money but you can't go and do something else? You know what I mean? You can't go and concentrate on something else because you're worried about the money situation or, you know what I mean? Your lizard brain's saying, you're stressed about this, you will deal with this now. Yes? And it will not allow you to go off and do something else. It'll say, I'm stressed about this, deal with this. You relate to that? So... That often happens in a very mild way when we go to bed. We get into bed and we're thinking about stuff and we can't go to sleep. And that's one of the advantages of reading a book. You get into bed, read a book, what does it do? It distracts your brain. You know, it puts some other story into your head and frees you up and allows you to go to sleep. I know extreme cases of this. You may have heard of it too. I know some people who get up two or three times in the night to smoke a cigarette because they're that stressed. Right? And it's usually business. It's usually business-related, money-related, okay? Uh, but so stressed, and of course the lizard brain's never sleeping. And it can actually wake you up, all right? It's, it's meant to wake you up in a case of danger, but it doesn't realise, well, there's really nothing you can do about your money situation at 3 o'clock in the morning, right? So it'll wake you up and, and you start to think about this. I've done it with the stock market. I've stressing about the stock market, all this sort of thing, woken up in the middle of the night, and that's when I sit down and I write an article. <laughs> So get it out of my head, all right? And that kind of releases me. <clears throat> but the lizard brain never sleeps, and it will wake you up if it has to. And as I say, it is possible to be so stressed about something, it will actually wake you up. Okay. Another common manipulation of the lizard brain is to reward ourselves. When you're working on some long-term goal, now your neocortex decides to diet, all right? Your neocortex wants to save money and buy a house. Not your lizard brain. Your lizard brain in particular hates dieting because it doesn't get to have yummy, sugary stuff. Okay? So when we set about some long-term plan, this, this lizard brain's into instant gratification. You hear it all the time. People say, you hear these things all the time. This is what we banged on about in the success community. Have goals. Have goals. Have goals. So important. Have goals. Why? Because you won't fall into the self-paradigm. What's going to drive you? If you don't have goals, you're likely to slip into the self-paradigm. Goals are very important. Okay? Put rewards. When you establish goals and you create plans, put rewards in along the way. Because these rewards are actually to treat your lizard brain. Because when you set about saving money and depriving yourself of all the great things in life, all right, your lizard brain goes on into a sulk. And eventually it's going to start to make more and more and more noise. And the longer and longer it takes you to achieve your goals, it's going to make more and more noise and more and more of a fuss until you appease it. So build in rewards to keep the lizard brain, to keep bribing it. <laughs> You're basically bribing it to keep it on, on track with, it, with, it, with, it, with, it, with a bigger project. Okay? Now that's a manipulation of your lizard brain by building in rewards. <clears throat> sometimes we need help with our lizard brains. They can get sick and they can get very out of control. So drinking, uh, drug abuse and gambling. All right, I'm going to talk about this now. Unfortunately, I have some uh, first-hand knowledge. Uh, alcoholism, drug addiction and gambling are often referred to as diseases of denial. Anyone here who's ever known anyone who's suffered from one of these parodies will know that uh, if they're a practising gambler, or a practising addict, or a practising drinker, that they have this denial. It's like 
they, they just can't see who and what they are and they just won't be told. Okay? This occurs when our old brain's natural defence mechanism works in reverse. What actually happens is we naturally block bad and painful memories. If you have a traumatic experience, you have amnesia. What happened? I don't know what happened for the last three days. You've heard that all the time. Mm. You, you, your brain automatically blocks it, right? Because it's very painful. And sometimes some of us have had such sort of difficult lives that if we remembered everything, all the painful experiences in our life, we'd never get out of bed, okay? So we have this natural defence mechanism where we block those memories, okay? It works in reverse. I'm telling you from personal experience, as a practising alcoholic, I used to do some terrible things when I drank. Guess what? I used to forget, okay? So I used to deny they ever happened. And this mechanism of forgetting about these painful memories and these negative, terrible experiences I had when I was under the influence of alcohol was denial. Okay? People would tell me what I did when I was drinking, I'd deny it. I'd go, no, I didn't do that. I'd never do something like that. All right? It's actually this safety mechanism, this survival mechanism working in reverse. And it's very, very deep-seated. Ever tried to reason with a person like that? You're wasting your time. Because this denial comes from their limbic system. You can't reason with the limbic system, remember? You can reason with the neocortex. The problem is actually deeper than that. This denial is a true, deep denial. Very much part of these diseases. You've got to get over that hurdle of denial. How do you do that?